Lee from Housing Innovations, and um, I am joined this morning by my colleagues, uh, Andrea White and uh, Shannon Quinn Sheeran, also from Housing Innovations. Um, and we've also got uh, Brenda Earl on the line this morning from, um, from Demis. I'm going to just do a couple of real quick housekeeping things, and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Brenda for a little welcome. Um, so just in terms of housekeeping, um, Shannon is going to be posting the slides into the chat box. They are also available on our website at www.ctboss.org. So if you're calling in uh, only by phone and are not on Zoom and want to follow along with the slides, um, please feel free to get them from the website. We are recording this morning's session, and the recording um, will be available on the CT Boss website by the end of the day today. Um, so if you've got folks who are not able to join um, and, and want to uh, listen in, feel free to direct them to that recording. For now, we've got everybody on mute, um, but certainly if you have a question or a comment, please use the chat feature. Um, and we'll answer uh, questions that are posted to that chat feature as we go along. Shannon will monitor that for us. Um, and then later on, uh, Andrea is going to um, be leading a discussion about self-care for outreach workers, and we will uh, allow everybody to unmute themselves at that point so that uh, people can participate orally in the discussion if they would like. Um, also, we really are um, wanting to make these sessions as helpful as possible for you guys. Uh, we know you're super busy and your time is valuable and precious. So if you've got suggestions or ideas for us about how to make these sessions uh, more helpful, please, please, please feel free to put those in the chat box or call uh, one of us on the Housing Innovations team or Brenda, um, and we will, and we will um, integrate your, your suggestions as we get them. So, okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brenda. Great, thank you, Lauren. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody, um, especially um, for joining this, because we're gonna have a lot of really good information, um, but also just for all of your hard work and your dedication to working with the unsheltered homeless population. Um, I'm just hearing such great things. You're all working so closely with the CANs, um, trying to house people right from their encampments, right from the hotels. Um, I just, again, want to thank you for all of that hard work and for your quick responses to all of my emails. Um, the PATH application into SAMHSA, we should get that in right on time. Thanks to all of you um, and your responsiveness. All your budgets and intended use plans are set and uploaded to SAMHSA. So thank you again for that. Um, and I'm going to give this back to Lauren because there's a lot to cover, but I'll pop back on at the end to give some updates um, and feel free to ask me questions throughout. All right, thanks, Brenda. So this is our agenda for this morning. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some local resources. We want to make sure that you guys have all the information that you need. Um, Diana um, Barubi is going to be uh, presenting from CCEH about some of the diversion resources that they have available. Uh, I believe Kara Copabianco is going to join us from DOH and uh, provide an update on um, hotels and motels and how that resource can be accessed for folks who are unsheltered. Um, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some uh, resources for uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, um, that are available locally. And then um, we will switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some updates from our national partners and best practices for things that uh, other communities are doing nationally um, in working with unsheltered folks. Uh, then I'm going to turn it over. The bulk of our time today is going to be, Andrea is going to lead us through some slides and a discussion about uh, making sure that we are taking great care of our amazing outreach workers. Uh, you guys are on the front lines every day and are such a critical part of this uh, public health response, and we want to make sure that we are uh, providing our outreach teams with lots of good uh, self-care and support. And then finally, Shannon is going to uh, wrap us up talking about some, um, re some additional resources and next steps, and we're going to just do two really quick Zoom polls to get your guys' input on whether and how you want to proceed um, with these uh, COVID COVID um, meetings. And then finally, like Brenda said, she'll wrap us up with just a quick update 
for um, the past uh, project. So if you're not a past project and want to hop off at that time, uh, please feel free to do that. All right, so I am going to turn us over to Diana Barubi from CCH to talk about prevention. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you to Housing Innovations for um, asking me to join this webinar this morning. I'm grateful to be here with, uh, with you all. Um, I know how difficult the outreach uh, job is as I've had experience in that myself. So at CCEH, we administer some emergency assistance funds, some flexible financial assistance funds to help folks and make your jobs a little bit easier. Um, in having the diversion conversations, sometimes it's just a little bit of one-time financial assistance that can help somebody resolve their homelessness. So we administer the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project. That is rapid exit from shelter and shelter diversion funds specifically for 18 to 24 year olds. So some of you may be um, youth navigators or working with youth navigators and they can access those funds to help those uh, young adults. We also administer the shelter diversion funds. Um, historically, that's our Be Homeful campaign. And historically that's been specifically to help families keep from um, experiencing any episodes of homelessness or having to enter emergency shelter. Within this pandemic, um, we've received additional funds within the past um, six months or so. And so we've been able to open up those Be Homeful diversion funds to individuals as well. Um, we also administer with new funding, rapid exit from shelter funds. Um, we try to make sure that we truly believe we can make um, any episodes of homelessness, um, rare, brief, and non-recurring. And so we want to try and get folks um, out of homelessness as quick as possible. And sometimes in having that problem-solving conversation, it's just that one-time flexible financial assistance that can help resolve someone's homelessness. Um, next slide. So who's eligible for our flexible financial assistance? Um, that would be people that fall into the HUD categories of homelessness, category one and category two. So any family or individual that is imminently homeless, um, that is facing um, eviction, which I know the state has halted right now, but, um, and also if they're staying with family or friends and about to be kicked out or um, couch surfing. Um, also, any family that or individual that has been verified to be sleeping in a place that's not meant for human habitation, so that would be the population that I believe most of you folks are working with. Um, those are people that might be sleeping out on the street, in a car, or in an abandoned building. Also, any family or individual that is staying in a hotel or motel that's paid for by a charitable organization or the state. So folks that are in hotels paid for um, by DCF, by DDS, or a faith-based organization would qualify for our financial assistance. Next slide. So how can you access CCH emergency assistance funds? Um, your agency must have a signed memorandum, memorandum of understanding, that's an MOU with CCEH. Um, those agencies that would qualify for an MOU if you don't already have one, need to have access to HMIS. Once your agency has a signed MOU, we, we would give you access to our smart sheets. That's our link to an online request form um, where you can put in requests for financial assistance. And next slide. Um, so the assistance is flexible for a reason. We, we encourage um, really creative problem solving. Um, so there's a number of allowable expenses. Typically, our programs get used for security deposit, um, but we try to break that misconception that it's just a security deposit program. Um, so these funds can be used for a number of things, um, utility deposits, rental application fees, moving expenses, transportation expenses, um, medical bills, um, whatever the, the, the one thing is that would help resolve somebody's homelessness, that's what we wanna try and focus on. Um, so we really do encourage creative problem solving. Um, if your agency does have a signed MOU and you wanna access the funds and you have questions about allowable expenses or questions about how we can assist, um, please feel free to reach out to me and I would um, I'd give you, uh, I'm sure that 
will send out my contact information at the end of this. Okay. All right. Thank you Thanks for having so me. much, Diana. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, a, just a quick reminder in case you're joining us late, if anybody has questions for any of our presenters this morning, please use the chat box. Shannon's going to be monitoring it for us and we'll get those, be sure to get those questions answered. So now I'm going to turn it over to Cara Capobianco, who's going to give us a quick update on um, how you can access hotels and motels for folks who are unsheltered, what's going on in that system. Good morning, everyone. So the hotels are mostly up and running. Um, the bigger communities, such as Hartford, Fairfield, New Haven, are all using um, a shelter wait list at this point because the demand is so high. And the shelter wait list has been weighted based on uh, medical vulnerabilities for COVID. So people who are elderly are generally jumping to the top of the shelter wait list uh, or hotel wait list. Some shelters are still um, operating outside of the hotels because they have physical spaces that allow for greater social distancing. Um, medical vulnerabilities, uh, diseases, uh, heart disease, diabetes, those will also jump you to the top of the list. So if you're elderly with heart disease, you'll probably be at the tippy top of the list. Um, some of the difficulties we're seeing now is getting people to leave the hotels um, to create room for new people. Um, so most of the, uh, both Hartford and Fairfield County are delivering letters to everyone in the hotel basically explaining the hotels are temporary. We're not sure if they'll last beyond June 1st, and the letters are referencing that there is financial assistance available. We didn't mention CCH or Be Homeful directly in the letter, but we said there's flexible financial assistance available for you to get housing. Now's the time to act while the funds are available so we can try and get some people to move out into housing so that there's room for people to come in off the streets. So um, the best way to do this is to contact uh, your local CAN lead um, to get them on the wait list. And if they were on a previous wait list, don't assume that that carried over to this one. Um, they completely had to redesign it. So Margaret would be New Haven, um, Amanda Gordon or Lisa Quach in Hartford, uh, Supportive Housing Works in Fairfield County. Um, if people are completely new to the system um, and they're not unsheltered, but I know you guys field a lot of questions and calls about what to do if someone's imminently homeless, 211 is still up and running. They're still functioning. They're still kind of registering people and setting up uh, CAN assessments that are all happening by phone right now. So if someone doesn't have a phone, it's really important to uh, tell the 211 contact specialists that information, and they're doing live patching over to some CANs where um, people are ready taking calls immediately from 211. They're just transferring them over. So you could call with your client um, and get them that way. But if they're well known and they've been unsheltered for a while, just connect with your local CAN to make sure that they're on the shelter priority list and all of their information about their medical vulnerabilities is there. Um, some of the CANs are giving outreach workers just a direct link to put people into the shelter priority list themselves. So if you're in Hartford and you're an outreach worker, you should have a link to the form to put people on the shelter priority list. Um, if you forget a medical vulnerability, I did this. I came across a client who her autoimmune disorder and her uh, lung disorder was not on there. So she was at the bottom because she was in her 50s. She wasn't elderly. Once we click those two boxes, she jumped right to the top. That doesn't mean that there's hotels for everyone. Uh, we're still trying to encourage housing and it's gonna be a massive push because when the, the hotels go away and that, that really is probably dependent on when the disaster declaration kind of gets reduced, shelters are not gonna be able to go back up to the census that they were operating at. By and large, they were overcrowded and would not be safe in the current environment. So we are pushing this rapid rehousing, rapid exit financial assistance as best we can. Um, 
and message to people that you are safest in, in a home. Any other questions I'm here to answer? Thanks, Kara. Um, all right. So again, if you have questions for Kara or Diana, please put them in the chat box. Um, I'm going to move quickly through the next set of slides so that we have plenty of time for the discussion. So um, we talked last time about obviously PPE being a critical component of safety for our frontline outreach staff. Um, and we know from the survey, you guys reported there were some gaps still in being able to get enough PPE for your staff and your clients. So we just wanted to go through um, what resources exist locally. And the first thing is that if you've not got enough PPE and you have not already, please, please, please be sure that you have alerted your public health department to that. So they should be kind of your first line of defense in making sure that um, you know, coordinated with emergency management, um, you know, that, that the critical frontline workers um, are getting the PPE that they need. And there's some information on this slide um, about in case you don't know who those folks are to put you in touch with those folks. Um, secondly, each of the CANs is uh, gathering uh, a wish list of PPE from all homeless service providers. So if you've got PPE needs and you haven't already, please be sure that you have alerted these people in your CAN. Um, last, the next set of resources is for masks. And we wanted to let folks know that uh, Liz Isaacs from our team at Housing Innovations uh, has been able to put her hands on 100 cloth masks. So if you need them, please uh, reach out to Liz. Shannon, can you put Liz's email in the chat box? Um, and uh, my email and Shannon's email is also on our final slide, so you can also reach out to Shannon or I, and we will put you in touch with Liz. So again, that's 100 masks, and Liz is located in Connecticut, and we'll figure out how to get them to you if you need them. Also on this slide, there's some other free resources that uh, our team has been able to identify locally for, for masks. This information was current as of a couple days ago, but we know that the landscape is changing quickly, so we apologize in advance if you reach out to any of these and they no longer have the supplies. But if that happens, let us know and we will continue uh, to look for new resources for you guys. Um, this next set of resources is for hand sanitizer. So some of it is for sale and to, uh, some of them have small quantities that they will give to uh, nonprofit organizations for free. And all the contact information for that is on this slide. And then lastly, here are some additional resources. Each of these have a hyperlink here. So if you click on the name of the organization, it will take you to their website. And these are resources that are for, uh, for purchase. OK. Um, so um, we know that there's so much new information coming out every single day. Um, and it can be very hard to, to keep track of everything. And you guys are super, super busy trying to house people and keep them safe and alive. And so part of what we um, want to try to do on these biweekly uh, sessions is just do a quick scan of new information um, that's come out nationally so that you guys don't have to spend so much time trying to um, keep track of all that stuff. So um, one big piece of news since we met last is uh, we talked last time about how important uh, symptom screening are, is to identify and isolate unsheltered folks who may be symptomatic. And we know that a lot of you are doing uh, symptom screening already. Um, since we met last, the CDC updated their list of symptoms. So it's now a two-tiered system. Um, you know, still obviously cough and shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. If they have any of those things, that would be a potential uh, sign that somebody's COVID positive. And then there's also a second tier of symptoms now. So, so somebody could have neither of those first tier things, but have at least two of the second tier, fever, chills, muscle pain, headache, repeated shaking with chills, sore throat, or new loss of taste or smell. And that would also be an indicator that they might be COVID positive. So if you have not already updated your symptom screening protocol, that's something that you might want to consider in light of this new information. Okay. The next thing we talked last time about the study that was done in the Boston shelter where they tested 100% of the clients and found that 37% of their folks um, were positive and asymptomatic. Since we met last time, the CDC released a larger study 
um, of, of from four cities where they tested all people in a shelter um, and similarly found some pretty high rates of asymptomatic infections. And so increasingly what that has meant is that there's, I think, growing awareness that if um, your only screening tool that you're doing is symptom screening, you're going to be missing a large number of asymptomatic folks that can potentially pass on the infection to other people. And so communities are more and more moving toward universal testing. Um, I think it started mostly in shelters, but is now also starting to move out to street outreach. So, for example, we know that LA um, and also Austin um, are doing free testing for all unsheltered people who want it. They're trying to get as many people tested as possible, focusing first, obviously, on the larger encampments. Um, and also being very careful about the messaging around that, right? Because we know that just because somebody tests positive or negative today does not mean that they will be negative tomorrow. And that there's also a high rate, uh, not a high rate, but there are some uh, false negatives. So just because you've tested negative does not mean that it's time to, you know, stop taking the precautions that you've been, that you've been taking. So if you are not already talking to your health department about the possibility of universal testing among street homeless people, that's uh, a conversation that you might want to get started. And whether or not that's going to be feasible is going to depend upon testing availability in your community. So, um, so you know, it will be up to the local health department and the emergency uh, management folks to decide how to best allocate tests to the extent that they're limited. I'm not going to go through this next slide. It's just some more information about the street wellness surge um, that they're doing in Los Angeles. And there's a link here so that you can find more information. Um, but the bottom line here, I think, is that, um, you know, the, that the effort should be a multidisciplinary effort that's engaging other partners and ideally embedding clinicians um, with your street outreach team so that some folks with some medical expertise um, can be uh, can be you know providing some clinical services to folks who are unsheltered, and I think that the universal testing is a is a potential path to try and um, you know to the extent that it's not already happening, uh, start to make that happen in in some of these communities. All right, and then lastly, uh, we just want to make sure we really cannot say enough. Um, you know. Outreach workers are absolutely essential frontline workers in helping uh, communities to manage this public health crisis, and we've got to make sure that uh, people are safe. And so these are the links to the CDC guidance about what to do if uh, an essential worker, like an outreach worker, um, is exposed to COVID-19, as well as the local Connecticut Department of Public Health um, resource for employers about how to make sure that um, workplaces are safe um, for essential for essential employees. All right, so I'm going to with that turn it over to Andrea. Thanks, Lauren. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you all are doing well. These are tough times, and we really appreciate what you're doing. I mean, there's, I mean. It's so important with the most vulnerable people we work with. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about how outreach workers can get some support. We're gonna talk a little bit about sort of getting a schedule and the schedule is so the days have some predictability. It's really easy to become overwhelmed with all the information that we're getting in. So. Part of it is getting yourself a schedule, talking about hope and competency and movement, getting a structure for client meetings so that we have sort of an outline that we can rely on, um, talk a little bit about resources, and then talk about some support that'll be available in your agency. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, one of the problems about the COVID crisis is it's long lasting, sort of like the crisis of homelessness. And um, one of the things that we've got to do is help people see their way through it and to see some of the light at the end of the tunnel. We have to remember that crisis creates chaos in people's lives and chaos can 
um, deflect us from the stuff that we're trying to accomplish. It can also make us feel overwhelmed, tired, sad, worried. And so we talked about a little hope and we talked about a little bit of structure in the day and structure in the day lets you see progress, which is really important. People also need support. They need to be able to talk to their supervisor. They need somebody who is not involved in the day-to-day -to, -day to sort of help them get a little bit of a perspective. People also need them to feel safe. And people also need a place to talk about, all of us have dreams about where we wanna be in our jobs and we need to have a place to talk about that because forward progress helps people feel whole. Um, they need, staff needs help and they need perspective and we're gonna talk about that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So one of the things to do, and some of you guys are on-site at hotels, some of you guys are on-site encampments, some of you all are um, doing outreach on a regular basis, some of you all are doing it from your homes. So let's focus a little bit about the on-site and I know some of you all are in shelters too. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has been helpful to other places is that teams, and I realize that some of you guys are an outreach team of one, but you wanna to get together with other people that are providing services to homeless people and have a daily meeting. <clears throat> it can be on the phone, obviously, it can be by Zoom. And um, sometimes it's even by text, though so it's better if you can talk to each other and talk about what you're gonna do during the day. One of the things that that assures is all the clients that you're working with get the attention that they need. But the other thing that that assures is, first of all, people know where you are, which is really helpful because safety is still a concern. But also, you can talk about it and you can ask for help. Everybody's had somebody who just drives them crazy, right? You're going to work in the morning or you're going on an outreach visit and you think, oh God, I hope Jack is not in the encampment today. Yeah, okay, so maybe somebody else has to work with them. And that's one of the things that you can do in these daily meetings. The other thing is you can you know, share resources about, um, you know, resources about PPEs, about all this stuff. The other thing that does is every team has got somebody who's really good at somebody. Think, think about it. You got somebody who's like, the SSI whisperer, or is really good with landlords, or when somebody's really agitated, they're the person that always calms people down. We need to know that about our teams. We need to solicit their input on how to work with the person, and sometimes we need to get them to go out too. So the team makes people feel like you're not alone. Once again, I know some people are an outreach team of one, but there are other people in your agency or maybe even other outreach teams you can talk to about this and sort of figure that out. The other thing is um, that we're gonna be seeing patterns, right? A lot of the case management and a lot of the work that you're doing in outreach, you're gonna see a bunch of people that are have a barrier to housing or a bunch of people that have a certain issue or, a bunch of people that need, for instance, the food fell apart for one encampment because the food pantry was overwhelmed. Okay, so one of the things that you can do is problem solve as a group. You can do it about behavioral patterns, you can do it about resources, but problem solving in a group, first of all, teaches us that we're not alone, which is a big help during this time. And the other thing is we often can draw on this expertise to really move forward. Working as a group can really be helpful. Um, the other thing is um, you know, doing some things that can involve people in a group. Yes, people have to socially distance, but in an encampment, can they figure out a food schedule for themselves? Or can they figure out a way to socially distance? Can they do things? And can you provide this education as a group? The benefit to that is you want peers and colleagues to help people continue that behavior even when you're not there. The other thing is that you can talk about success and we learn a lot about how we work from talking about successes. And my advice to you is always when you're talking about people you're serving and how we're gonna help them, 
don't only don't only focus on the barriers and that's a natural instinct in the time times of crisis <clears throat> it's a natural instinct for everybody and one of the things that we need to do is make sure we talk about successful interventions so we can learn about that the other thing and you heard this going on here is we want to temper expectations if your goal is to house every single one of your people, that's a great goal, but we need to realize that it takes time, that they're priority lists, that we're gonna house people in groups, and we need to see success in these small steps, because if we're only focused on the end, we're gonna be frustrated and we're gonna feel like we're not as competent, and feelings of competence helps people continue. So we wanna make sure that we're tempering our expectations, we're talking about successes, and that we have a chance to get supervision. And one of the things, supervision really consists of support, education, but also um, some, well, some uh, helping people to move forward. So one of the things that we want to do is feel like you're able to talk to your supervisor about you know i was in school before all this stuff started and now i feel like i've been stepped back and that's frustrating right that's always going to be in the back of your mind so you want to be able to talk about that and maybe alternate plans to move forward with your career ambitions because we're not stopping just as the people we serve aren't stopping we're not stopping either so you need a place to talk about that that could be group supervision that could be individual supervision thanks lauren the other thing is if you are providing remote support that can be infinitely more complicated so one of the things that we want to do is still have the brief daily meeting and talk about what we're going to do during the day it leads to some structure in the day we also want to have a priority list and we also want to support each other individual supervision once again is really helpful the other thing is really encourage people to take breaks. If you're working out in the field or you're working at home, you need to take a break. And just FYI, taking a break for lunch and tutoring your kid in math, that's not a break, y'all, right? You may have to do that, but you want to make sure that you've got some time to just think. The most, the hardest thing about crisis for me is you got to be able to take a breath and really look at what you're doing and if you can't do that it begins to spiral really quickly you want to be able to problem solve with coworkers. you want to set up that team meeting for yourself or have your supervisor set it up you want to do the same thing you want to acknowledge expertise you want to let the people talk about something that they're good at like the ssi whisper or the landlord whisper um you need to you know problem solve you need to acknowledge people you need to make sure that people are focusing on goals that are incremental as opposed to just the last goal because that's really frustrating and we need once again to help people talk about things that are doing going right sometimes it's really hard so i've been recently in a couple of meetings and we try to do this silver linings thing or moments for mission in the beginning and it's really hard for people to talk about that because people are in the crisis. So talking about it in the specific about some successes you've had can be really helpful. Okay, next slide, please. The other thing is we wanna really recognize people, both the people we serve and our colleagues. During times of crisis, kindness is really underrated. If people do something that's kind, we want to really encourage that. Somebody cooks for other people in the encampment or shares something with them or helps somebody manage some of the expectations around social distancing. We want to talk about how helpful that is because unless we get all in this together and if people don't know that these things are recognized, they're not going to keep doing them. The other thing is we want to recognize competency, both with the people we serve and with each other so we're going to talk about successes but we're also going to talk to people about you know things that they've been able to accomplish look if somebody was able to get some id that's going to make housing more possible you know have a cake or something i mean let's do something 
positive and really reward people. The other thing is to help staff set reasonable goals, right? And these are process goals. So how many, how many um, benefits applications are you gonna do? And set a reasonable number. What I usually do is get everybody to talk about it and usually people's numbers are way too high and then we cut them in half, right? We wanna also offer people that education part and talk about housing options and talk about creative ways that somebody's on the list for a hotel, okay, they may get into a hotel, but what do we need to do to get them into housing? We're gonna talk about um, you know, involving people in an activity. Look, you know, we have a group that's um, providing a bingo game in a, in a hotel where everybody sits in their doorways with their masks on and they play bingo for gift cards, okay? Snacks are the other big ones. So you know what? Just doing that for an hour and a half gives, some, gives people a break, gives people a chance to think about other things, also really supports the, um, supports the shelter in place. Other things in hotels that have been really good is, you know, book clubs and reviewing Netflix films. And one group got a, a newsletter going with recipes you could make in your microwave. Any of that stuff that engages people's minds and helps them feel like they're moving forward. It's not, you know, you can't do the housing, especially since we don't know how long it's going to take. You can't do the housing 24 seven. So really supporting those activities can be helpful. The other thing is supporting um, uh, harm reduction plans related to the quarantine. Everybody is not going to be able to follow all the rules, right? Why should be this be different than any other time? Everybody's not going to be able to do it. So what are some harm reduction strategies? And we're going to talk about that. The other thing is talk about things post-crisis, right? Talk about it in the supervision, school, promotion, that sort of thing. And then look for empathy, right? Yes, it's frustrating when people won't wear a mask. Yes, it's frustrating when people say, I don't need to do this. Jesus told me I didn't have to wear a mask. Okay, so how are we going to deal with this? And think about what that person is going through. A lot of times it comes from fear, and it might come from a psychiatric symptom. It might come from a lot of things. But really talk about what you think is behind this behavior. The other thing is we can't solve all problems and we gotta model it and we're gonna have to put some off, right? Because otherwise people are deluged with things that they have to do. And what that results in is people doing small things every time they meet with people and people not feeling forward progress. How people get out of a crisis and how people work through a crisis is to feel some, pro, pro, some movement. The other thing is to design some policies and look for comfort for people. Can you get things that make them feel more comfortable? We need to realize that this, this, this virus is causing a lot of death and that some people may really be worried about is dying, dying alone and not being buried properly. This is a big fear. We know this came up big time during the AIDS crisis. These are resources that we'd like to help you get. Actually, if you look at the, there was a Demas um, webinar on um, help for seniors and um, dealing with crisis with seniors, then it has a lot of those resources and we'll make sure that's posted up here on the website so that you can get those resources, but you need to be able to talk to people about it. That's just an example of things that people are afraid of, but having the resources and having a plan ahead of time, that can really be helpful. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. The other thing is to give, give everybody some structure for the client meeting, right? So if you're gonna meet the client, what are you gonna do? You're gonna meet them face to face, you're gonna do it on the phone. One of the things that we're asking people to do is check in, provide them with some education around COVID, have a conversation about symptoms, ask them what they need for more help. Okay, so we start there. We also know that we have some resources to offer. Um, Lauren and Shannon have offered links to this stuff. So 
how can we give them information? A lot of people don't have internet access, obviously, in the woods. So let's give them something that's printed so that people can hold on to it. The other thing is we want to focus, focus on basic needs and comfort, right? So make sure that people have food, safety, that they feel safe, that they have a safety plan. Um, ask about things about how they're securing, especially in hotels, how they're securing their smokes, how they go in and out. And also, you know, alcohol, drugs, friends, families. We're going to make a plan about how to deal with this in this new reality that we're in. We're going to encourage people to make a plan. And it's going to start day by day. Remember, people are in a crisis. They may not be able to, you know, put things out in the future. So let's start day by day. But we're also going to refer to the plan. Plan gives people structure and purpose. It also allows them to see they're making progress. So we want to do that. We want to refer to the plan. We want to give them something in writing. And we want to always teach problem solving. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So it's the next slide, please. Andrew, we've got about 10 minutes left, so we probably want to open it up soon for um, discussion if that. Okay. If we can. This is just a simple problem solving chart, right? Okay, so somebody says to you, I need money, I'm going to go out and collect cans. Okay, let them take a breath and figure out what that does. So what are the benefits of that? Okay. So what are their options? Maybe they could apply for benefits so they have some money so they don't need to go out and collect cans. But what's the likely outcome? And you wanna ask the client this, it takes too long. Okay, well, we know that people have gotten them. Um, can we do it both at the same time? That sort of thing. Um, PPEs, getting things I need, how do they do it? Okay, I, I can go to a food bank and that'll help me, but food banks don't have beer. Okay, so beer is an issue. Let's talk about how you can secure that resource. Let's talk about if you maybe you're using less, is it possible? Can you do other things? So this is just a chart and you want people to think about the likely outcome. It's a way to start a harm reduction thing. I hope this makes sense. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So this is just about supervision and we talked about this a lot, but supervision and team meetings and daily briefings can be really helpful. Um, these are just some things that I hit on before and what we wanna do is open it up and then listen. Okay, great. If it's helpful, that's great. And I'm, you know, I think there was some really helpful information earlier on. Do people have comments about this? Are you guys doing daily briefings? I, I'm gonna go ahead and allow folks to unmute themselves. So it, um, you can, if you're only calling in, you can use star six to unmute yourself on your phone, um, or there's a little microphone icon next to your name on Zoom. You can click there and unmute yourself that way on Zoom. If you're not able to unmute and you want to participate in the chat box, that, that also works. We'll read the chats that come in out loud. Hey, Lauren, why don't we just go to the closing slide because that provides people with sort of with the summary. There we go. Sure. Great. Are these things that people feel like they can do? Is it hitting on some of the stuff that you're feeling when you're doing the work? It goes on a couple of themes, right? People feel more in control if they feel like they have choices, they feel like they can measure progress, and if they feel competent. And you know what? It's hard to feel competent in the middle of a crisis, but it's really hard long term. You're doing great, great meetings with your manager. That's really helpful. Nico, do you have other people in your agency that you could meet with that might be, be able to provide some things like people that work in shelters or transitional and they may have some ideas? But it's great you're meeting with your manager. Anybody else? Maybe we're not hitting it. Are there things that you need? Yep. Why 
Somebody was getting ready to say something. Don't all talk at once, y'all. I'm not sure if my laptop speaker picks up very well, so I apologize. That's pretty good. Nice. Um, but to answer your question from before, aside from meeting with my manager and my assistant program director who directly oversee me at, at the um, Homeless Outreach, uh, on a weekly I speak to other outreach workers. Great. Uh, from Mubachi from Waterbury Hospital, uh, from St. Mary's Hospital, uh, Rick Povolitis, another one. Great. Some other coaches just as to get to get a sense for where I'm not looking, where they may not be looking. Yep. Um, now the I also meet with the um, the opiate task force for the Torrington Winstead area. We meet weekly since this all began. So just taking a different perspective and seeing what the shelter life is versus the hotel versus maybe uh, in Waterbury the homeless drop in center reopened for uh, limited use in hours. So I am. That's great. You know what else that does, Nico, is help to get a perspective, like you said, that's not your own. And then you're able to describe what living in the shelters is like to people and the hotels. So we have more information because giving people choices means we have to lay out the information. That's terrific. Right, right, right. Courtney, um, it, said that um, they meet with their supervisor daily and other outreach workers multiple times a week. That's great. That is really great. Does it help? Oh. For me, it does. Uh, it definitely gives me some, some guidance and some structure, like you said before. It's easy great. to lose some of that structure when you're at home and you're you're teaching subjects you never went to school to teach as well as trying to check yeah. on on your client base so yeah. that, that it, it's almost like a soft reset it's like, okay that's what my uh that's what that's what you might need to reset yourself so okay this is what i was working on that this was the thing i was doing this was the client i was assisting yep yeah. it's really helpful you know i think that this work during this crisis is going to really have implications of how we provide outreach going forward and it's something to think about like what worked and what didn't work and engaging in that sort of critical thinking conversation can give us more of a sense of we have control of the situation which is helpful i'll tell you something else for somebody who works at home all the time having a schedule is really important because there's lots of distractions and it is a soft reset. This is what I'm working on. This is what my priorities are. Totally agree. Anybody else? No? Okay. We're gonna do some polls with you all. So I think that that's gonna be important. Yeah, keeping up to date. Do we wanna move on? Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Shannon and she's going to lead us through the next set of slides and the polls. Great. So let me go ahead and launch our poll here. So the first poll is, would you all like to continue to convene these COVID outreach meetings? If yes, choose bi-weekly, you, you could choose yes monthly, or if you're not finding them valuable and you have other things to do with your time, then you can choose no as well. Um, we're gonna give you all a couple of seconds to finish this poll. During the second poll, I think David Gonzalez Rice has a few announcements. So maybe while we're waiting for the votes to tally up, he can um, speak about what he wants to speak about. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. Seconds. Thanks, Shannon. Can you hear me? Well, yeah, but hold on. Yep. Let me just finish this one poll, then when gotcha. the second poll come on, yeah. Um, so it looks like 48% of the people have voted so far. Um, 
some folks may be participating by um, by phone and so unable to vote. Um, okay. So when you're ready for me to close it, just let me know, Shannon, and then I'll close it and publish the results. Okay, I, th I think we'll probably go ahead and close it out. 69% of the people you want to show the results if you can. 69% of the people who voted said yes, they're, they're wanting to continue to meet and want to meet bi-weekly. A few people, 31% said um, yes, monthly. So we'll probably go ahead and continue to meet bi-weekly um, and we'll have some information on that towards the end of the, um, end of the webinar. Okay, the next poll is um be able to do that Laura. the mm -hmm. next poll there we go is, is would you all like to convene a case conferencing meeting um and this is some of what andrea was touching on before where there might be that might be a helpful setting for us all to come together convene remote case conferencing talk about specific details of cases that you're dealing with getting on track um, self-care strategies, all the things that Andrea was hitting on before. So you see the responses, yes, bi-weekly, yes, monthly, or no. Um, and while we're waiting, David, why don't you go ahead? Great, thanks very much, Shannon. Thanks, Brenda, for giving me a couple mm -hmm. minutes of her time. I wanna let you all know that CCEH drafted a circular letter summarizing some of the national guidance, including the CAC CDC recommendation that um, authorities not clear or sweep encampments during this time. So we had one report of a community where that um, may have happened. Uh, the audience for that memo is really uh, law enforcement agencies, municipal employees, local health departments, and we have uh, colleagues on the state level who are pushing that message to those networks. So I want you to hold that in your back pocket. If you get wind of an uh, imminent or recent uh, clearing events of an encampment in your community or even just of unsheltered people who are kind of getting the move along from law enforcement, I want to encourage you to reach out to uh, Kara Capobianco, Lee Shields Church, and myself, uh, who will be working with Brenda and others to address situations as they come up. But that memo also directs your colleagues in municipal government, law enforcement, and health departments uh, to reach out to us and to you. Um, so hopefully that um, can uh, strengthen your hand and those of your clients when you're, um, you know, supporting them in, and their rights in, in this time. That's all I've got. Thanks. Thanks a lot, David. Okay, um, if we want to go ahead and publish these results, it looks like 57% said yes, they would like to meet with, uh, do a case conferencing meetings bi-weekly. Um, and a few, a couple said yes monthly, and four people said no, that wouldn't be helpful. So we'll probably go ahead and convene those meetings. These are optional, they're, if they're helpful for you, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the webinar as well. There's a couple slides if we don't get to them, there's a couple slides at the end that do have that information on them, and we'll be sending it out to all of you as well. All right, next slide. Um, I want to draw your attention that there is, I, again, there's a lot of information on these slides. I'm going to go through, pick out a few key points, but um, if you want to go through again when you have time, it might be helpful for you. That there is some relaxed criteria for, um, for uh, entering PSH right now. Beginning on April 1st and until the COVID restrictions are lifted, the disabling condition requirements are relaxed. So um, HUD is accepting for COC PSH programs written self-certifications from the person seeking PSH assistance that they have a qualifying disability um, for PSH. So this applies to individuals and family. The head of household has to have this disabling condition. We're accepting self-certification. We ask that that be combined with provider certification. So a case manager or an outreach worker, someone else certifying that they agree that this person has a qualifying disabling condition. There's more information about what that might look like, look like at the CT Boss website. There's a link here and um, a, a Connecticut 
disability self-certification form to be completed if you're going to use that. We would like to just remind you all that PSH is a very limited resource, so we still want to choose those people or, or work with those people to get into PSH who are the highest severity of need. Um, and this waiver applies to DMIS and DOH PSH projects. Other programs that, that have PSH should be checked on a case-by-case -case basis because we're not sure if everybody has applied for this waiver, but we know DEMIS and DOH have. Okay, next slide. Uh, just a couple, like this is an excellent resource that has very practical guidance. As you see in the pictures here, they give tips on how to make, create your own hand washing station, but other, some other information as well, working with landlords, supporting staff. Okay, next slide. Mental health resources. This NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Health guide that, that is linked here has a lot of really practical, good information on it. Next slide. Behavioral health and harm reduction. Some, some of what Andrea talked about earlier. Um, some of these resources, supportive practices for mental health professionals, but, but at the very bottom, the resource for people who are um, using substances. Um, so these people who are putting themselves, who are at, at harm, it gives you risk reductions, not for just substance use, but then for COVID as well, because some of the drug seeking behavior or e even going out to, to procure alcohol can put you in harm's way in terms of mixing with the general population and the need for masks. So there are excellent tips on how to mitigate those risks on that resource as well. Okay, let's move on. COVID-19 resources. Um, at the bottom of this is the uh, uh, resource, a uh, tip sheet on the stimulus check, which um, most, if not all, of our clients are going to be eligible for and unemployment. So I would point you towards that resource if you haven't already worked with your clients on being able to get that stimulus, economic stimulus payment. Move forward. And this is a general resource. And a lot of these have many resources, most of, or, or all of them have many resources within them. So if you're looking for something specific, I'm sure it's out there and likely at one of these sites. Go ahead. So case conferencing, I mentioned that we're, we are going to do a case conferencing meeting next Thursday, the 14th from 11 to 12. Andrea is going to facilitate that meeting. So I encourage you all to join if you can and if you think that's going to be helpful. The lines will be open. You'll be able to talk the whole time. I encourage you to use your cameras if you feel comfortable because in this time of physical distancing, seeing each other, talking to one another is, is, is likely to be an excellent support for all of us. Next slide. And then the, we will we will have a next outreach meeting that will be on Thursday, May 21st. I want to let you know, like, please note the time will change from one to two. There's another meeting earlier that day, so we changed this one to meet from one to two. Um, we'll send out information on both of those for you. Go ahead. Next slide. Here's our contact information and Brenda. Sorry, <laughs> one minute left. <laughs> Are you ready for me? Yes. Yeah, we can go over a couple okay. of if you need. Sorry about that, Brenda. That's okay. It should be pretty quick. Um, mostly my message is kind of out for the um, path providers. Um, I just wanted to quickly put a little bit of a bug in your ear around your outreach plans and your assessments. A lot of the great work that we did last year kind of um, building up all of the different standardized forms for PATH, including the updated monitoring guide. Um, I know we kind of implemented a lot of that in March and then the COVID virus kind of came around and, and a lot of that might have stopped. Um, I want to encourage you to keep updating your outreach plans. I still think they're a really good tool, but if you're finding in your agency or within your outreach team that you're hitting any walls or barriers, around any of the sections in your outreach plan or use of your assessment tool or HMIS data entry that you send me an email um, and we can kind of work one-on-one -on -one between myself and housing innovations so we can kind of see what's going on. I just don't want anyone to get monitored later in the summer or next year and not have some documentation around what you might have been seeing as some barriers. So if you have any questions, just shoot me an email or call me 
and maybe in two weeks we could talk a little bit more about it if I get some emails from you. Um, I just want you to know we're here. We're open-minded. Obviously, we pushed off monitoring. We're going to try to do some smaller version of that later in the summer um, because it is a SAMHSA requirement, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's it. If you're a subcontracted agency of a path lead agency, my preference would be for you to communicate with the lead agency on anything that you might see as a barrier and then the lead agency kind of send me an email for that whole path um, geographic area. I would appreciate that. Um, and then my last thing was just again to kind of thank everybody. I'd really like to give a shout out to Housing Innovations. You're just Johnny on the spot. You're so great with doing all of this national research and kind of getting it all into a webinar um, every couple of weeks. So I really appreciate that. CCEH, DOH, just all these different partnerships and collaborations. We wouldn't be able to do it without each other. And of course, the providers. Again, just thank you for just being out there on the front line and um, just really working to house people. I can't thank you enough. All right. Well, thank you, Brenda, and thank you, everyone, for spending this precious hour with us this morning. We look forward to seeing those of you who want to join for the case conferencing session uh, next Thursday or the following Thursday um, for our regular biweekly meeting. And in the meantime, um, take good care of yourselves, take good care of your family, uh, be kind to yourselves, be kind to other people. You guys rock. Um, and we need you to, um, you know, to, to, it's, it's so important that the work that, that you're doing. And so stay healthy so that you can, uh, so that you can uh, keep, keep being there for your clients and, and your family. So, okay, be well, everyone. Take good care.